After Unger unleashes his disintegrator ray on the despised upper world, that is, us, he surveys the resulting damage on his flat glass reflector plate. This is yet another unlikely technology, of course. The swooping electron beam of the cathode ray tube must project onto a concave surface to compensate for the visual distortion that occurs at the limits of the beam's path. And since the inner workings of the television are largely packed into a vacuum, the curved glass also stands as a bulwark against the pressures of the atmosphere. Unga's fantastic realm, though, suffers under no such constraints. As we viewers at home are treated to over-the-shoulder shots from Unger's point of view, we get to share his vantage as he lays waste to city blocks of the upper world. But in an intriguing sound bridge, we learn our cadre of heroes, Professor Norton, Crash, Young Billy, and Diana, are seeing the devastation only in their mind's eye as Unga's screen fades to the quartet standing around listening to the bulletin on a radio. What a scoop for our paper, proclaims Diana, running off in pursuit of the story. So tidily does this fleeting scene lift off the three major media of today in their proper proportions. Radio, the main provider of news and entertainment, is at once the center of attention and barely worthy of mention. Diana, spokeswoman for the newspaper industry, dashes hither and yon, eager if not desperate for a story, and this only stands to reason. Six years previous, there were 1,942 daily newspapers in the United States. But over the decade, papers have folded and the print media are losing market share to radio so quick, it's feared the newsstand paper might soon go extinct. Television, meanwhile, remains mostly a figment, an imagining in the minds of radio listeners or Unga's fantastic device. The three years since Kingdom have seen enough refinement in the technology of television that is ready to be shown off as an exotic offering at the 1939 New York World's Fair. About the size of Onga's reflector plate, but with a screen one quarter the dimension, a television like NBC's floor model would go for about $600, or four months average salary. Still wanting for buyers as well as programming, television nevertheless glows with promise, destined to revolutionize the household of the future. Perhaps in 10 or 20 years, our own living rooms might resemble Unga's undersea lair. In keeping with the spirit of the age, Phantom Creeps, 1939, episodes 203, 205, and 206, short subjects, is propelled by novelty and invention. Most of this springs from the brilliant, if not particularly efficient, Zorka. Among his trinkets, a mechanical spider and metal disc, which combine to produce an explosive vapor, it puts anyone nearby into a state of suspended animation. He also has a ray gun that spews negative scratches, but for some reason he needs to spray his target with a separate solution before the ray gun will work, so he tends not to use it very often. His mammoth Iron Man, whose haunting visage is what the serial's best known for, is a kind of radio-controlled mechanical marionette. He's not put to much use either, one thinks mainly, because the actor inside seems to be having prohibitive trouble getting the thing to move around. More practical is Zorka's devisualizer, which turns him into a nearly invisible wisp, hence the serial's title, which is a full sentence rather than a noun phrase. There are no creeps here. Zorka's principal innovation, though, is his meteorite. Extracted from an African volcano, the talisman exudes a steam so toxic it can scarcely be contained. The meteorite's powers will look familiar to anyone who's read speculation by the aforementioned H.G. Wells and quite a few others including the decade's own real-life mad scientist, Albert Einstein, on the subject of whether the atom can be split, and if so, what the consequences might be. But in the Phantom Creeps' universe, the meteorite's power is the one thing originating from mystical rather than scientific sources. After all, the miracle of atomic power has not yet been harnessed, and it's not clear that it ever will be. Zorka might have a good understanding of how to exploit the meteorite, but his benevolent counterpart, Dr. Mallory, is more intimately familiar with its inner nature. In trying to unlock its secrets, he accidentally releases some of the meteorite's vapor and reels a moment with his hand at his throat, death blowing through him like a dank breeze. Science having made Mallory happy-go-lucky, he only wastes a moment fretting over his close call and instead immediately begins analyzing his experience in the hope that he can unlock the box's function. 
Then there's Perkins, Runt, and Lackey for the foreign spies. When they have their turn at the box, he volunteers to open it because, working stiff that he is, he doesn't care to go on living anyway. On waking, he complains of being snatched from a pleasant dream. So the theology of the phantom creeps, to the extent it has one, can be said to include an afterlife, at least. What'd you wake me up for? I was having a swell dream. The idea of bombing cities might have been a flight of fancy for a bookish fellow like H.G. Wells, but for thugs like Tojo, it was pretty easy to come by. The greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere bombed cities when it spilled into eastern China in 1937. The Imperial Army Air Force blanketed Shanghai and Nanking in flame. The Nazis targeted central Brussels for systematic destruction the same year, and Picasso tied the transition from theoretical to actualized aerial violence with his twisted nightmarish Guernica. In the early days of the Nazis' westward expansion, the Fuhrer was less showing inventiveness than a willingness to break rules of war that had previously been at least ostensibly sacrosanct. Aerial bombing has gone from theory to practice, in the arc from Undersea Kingdom to the Phantom Creeps too. Forget engineering, planning, war college sophistication. In the Phantom Creeps, fire rains wantonly down from the sky, the girl reporter flinging grenades with glee from a wobbling miniature plane. In the series Denouement, Zorka flings bits of the meteorite down on the sea, sinking two ships bent on putting a stop to his mad gambit for world domination. Here, the filmmakers over-rely on reckless jump cuts. The skittering, then power-mad girl reporter leads with her elbow and pitching iron pineapples out of the twin engine's double door. Then we cut the sedans flying off the highway. Zorka's bombing campaign is spliced together with stock footage of bombing tests on moribund vessels made earlier in the century. A real train barrels down the track, but a miniature plunges down the cliff the following week. In all this, the serial gets cut together with its mad pastiche of differently layered, lit, and gathered shots, but a sense of space is lost. There's no orientation. We will find this feeling of vertigo to be a theme in the next decade and in those that succeed it. The ominous spring of 1940, the U.S. House of Representatives holds hearings regarding a slake of propagandist films encouraging U.S. entry into World War II. The situation in Europe is not great. Germany has run roughshod over the Western European territories and is poised to conquer Britain. I Married a Nazi and The Mortal Storm feel dated on their release this year since, like any movie, they pass time in editing and distribution talks after their completion. When I Married a Nazi was written, likely 1938, the National Socialists had not yet claimed Czechoslovakia and the Sudetenland and the movie is caught up with the prospect of their annexation. Here's something about narrative film is accented that rates further explanation. The fact that movies are completed and then released. This means that they are often associated, for archival purposes, with two competing dates, when a movie is shot and when it opens. For seasonal films, Jean and Kathleen Lockhart's A Christmas Carol, for instance, this usually isn't an important issue. Their premiere can be held until their season rolls around. But for a topical picture like Mortal Storm, as is also true for the press, prompt publication is vital. Delay jeopardizes the film's relevance, which in turn puts its financial success at risk. Such films must be understood as the product of two times, the period in which they were conceived and made, and the weeks, and if the makers are lucky, months after they come out. The wider the gap between these indicators, the greater the chance that the cast and crew's perspective and that of the overall culture, the market for which these products are targeted, will diverge. The hearings also indicate that narrative film wields enough power to impress the interventionists and alarm the America Firsters. The power I refer to, of course, is that of the movie makers to influence the general public, to shape the attitudes of the latter to more closely adhere to those of the former. The more conspiratorially minded have already noticed that it would be possible to lead popular opinion toward any attitude of the movie makers choosing. Even as Europe and Asia sink into war, America is rising out of the Great Depression, or so we're told. The stories conveyed in cinema are largely stories of wastelands. 
and wastelands have been the Depression's chief harvest. Take the previous year's Oscar winner, The Wizard of Oz, which begins in black and white, Dust Bowl, Kansas. Once Dorothy, the movie's doe-eyed heroine, is whisked away to Oz, the movie turns to vibrant and pricey color. The movie presents this as a transition from social and economic misery to youth, happiness, and vitality. The vitality the movie offers can be thought of either as a reality more essential than our own, almost a platonic realm of perfect abstract forms, or as a delusional daydream. In neither case is it America's quotidian existence, which is becoming more and more one of atomized urban, suburban, and rural enclaves. Where the television stands to revamp the layout of the American living room, another idea unveiled at the 1939 World's Fair stands to revamp that of the entire American household and the land on which it lies, the planned community. Presented as part of the City of Tomorrow exhibit, the short film The City promotes the planned community as a salve for the Industrial Revolution sting. Here, director Ralph Steiner idealizes America's agricultural legacy since her colonial days, meanwhile suggesting an alternative to the drudgery of farming and factory work. The model for this alternative is Greenbelt, Maryland, with its common-sense designs offering a balance of labor and play. In futuristic Greenbelt, which was built two years before in the northern suburbs of Washington, D.C., workers lived near their jobs. Greenbelt and its environs are indeed functional, but also have an air of the alien. The town's parks and boxy homes are sparely ornamented and set off with concrete walls and sidewalks. The roads in and out wind and twist, rather than meeting at right angles, and are accessed from the throughway, another recent contrivance, using something called a cloverleaf, a symmetrical arrangement of paved circular ramps that allow rushed drivers to leave and enter town without too much maneuvering. Once arrived, green belters find everything they need in their local neighborhood. Residence, school, house of worship, and shopping are a short walk, bike ride, or drive away. But there's a homogeneity to it. Few ornaments adorn green belts' outdoor spaces. What fences there are have no spires. The schools are square and dreary. The Phantom Creeps gives us a good example of the traditional mode of human habitation that mixed-use zoning like green belts is meant to remedy. Revolving around a MacGuffin-esque meteorite with magical, potentially apocalyptic, destructive powers, the Phantom Creeps tightly arranges its various actors each in a unique category of living environment, and each environment is so quintessentially its own that there's no room for confusion. To capitalize on the star power of Bella Lugosi, the movie makers situate Dr. Zorka's basement lab in the usual Transylvania-styled Black Forest estate, a peculiar haunting stand-in for the American countryside. The G-men dog Zorka from the perfect cover of a nondescript suburban home. The foreign spies trying to steal the Pandora's box containing the meteorite work their operation from a school of international languages in a downtown high-rise. The planned community is further endorsed in the privately funded Hired, episode 423, short subject, and A Case of Spring Fever, episode 1012, short subject, considering the dreary light these shorts cast on its alternative. In Spring Fever... A middle American husband, annoyed to be tightening springs around the house when he could be playing golf, condemns the very existence of the simple device and so is robbed of it by a fickle and different universe. For a brief but hellish time, he fumbles about, unable to make anything work for want of torque and tension. The front door won't shut, the car won't get any gas, the watches won't wind. When the magic of springs is given back to him, he's so delighted he spends the rest of the short unable to shut up about it. But he seems to have missed the larger point. Without the contrivances of his auto and his other modern conveniences, he's paralyzed. The suburbs offer no other resources, no community to whom he can turn. He's isolated and alone. 
The state of nature is nasty, brutish, and short. A similar abandonment awaits the salesmen of Hired as they prowl the streets of single-use suburbs. They hope to sell cars but mostly face slamming doors. These newly minted enclaves for this newly minted middle class, these suburbs, aren't without their downside. You have to drive to get anywhere. Greenbelt's example is not caught on, and instead of self-sustaining communities, Chevrolet's salesmen have to deal with matrices of suburban homes spanning block after block, mile after mile. The city planners behind the city have lost. This is how the future will be, the world according to Phantom Creeps. Residential, commercial, industrial, each team on its own turf. Hired keenly illustrates the extent to which physical space in America has become at once more traversable and more vexing. More vehicles mean more Americans have the luxury to cross distances quickly that were impassable only a decade before, or even more recently. On the other hand, the need to cross such distance is quickly becoming more acute, and it's not just coincidence that this trend dovetails with the proliferation of the automobile. Each enables the other. Henry Ford's famous equation has it that auto workers at his Model T plants should be compensated well enough to afford the product their labor helps build. The idea behind this, or so Ford Motor Company claims, is to encourage livable factory communities by paying a living wage, and also to give the workers a stake in the product they've made. Ford's principal innovation, the assembly line, otherwise erodes the sense of worker investment acutely. No longer on hand for their skill or craftsmanship, assembly line workers instead are useful only for their ability to manipulate machinery and their willingness to spend most of their waking life engaged in stultifying repetitive tasks. The dullness of the assembly line has long been the subject of arch-leftist critique, most famously in Fritz Lang's 1929 Metropolis, to which the Phantom Creeps' Iron Man design seems to owe a debt. Henry Ford's promise of middle-class worker compensation seems meant as a concession to this, a bargain in which one accepts a maddeningly dreary and often dangerous work routine in exchange for the promise of community and comfort in the off hours. The principal irony of Ford's equation, of course, is that once one has a car, one needn't situate oneself in the factory community at all. The days bring such misery that, come quitting time, the worker wants nothing more than to get as far from the factory as possible. It feels like a deep plunge from the static surface world to the depths of the miraculous sea. <laughs>